Lance Richardson was president of American Family Institute until his death in March 2004, an organization dedicated to rebuilding America through strengthening the family. He has spoken around America on family topics, emergency preparedness, and on solutions for our current societal problems, as well as his program herein, They Saw Our Day detailing many of the legends and prophecies of cultures throughout the world who have prophetic glimpses of our day. Lance has also been a radio talk show host for both regional and national shows for several years. Lance authored the books The Message, Knotted Gold, and co-authored Masquerading as Angels, Zion Seeking the City of Enoch, and Zion, The Long Road to Sanctification. Lance has studied cultures from around the world with their prophecies and legends for several years, in particular the Hopi Indians. He has traveled to meet and interview several of these groups. He has found some powerful solutions for our time in their stories. Lance is the father of six boys and one girl and is married to the former Josette Miller. Lance did a lot of research and he came across uh, some information on the Hopi Indians. And so I went down to the Hopi Reservation, and Lance will tell you all about that. But one has led to another, to another, to another, and now we have several tribes and actually several continents that have been involved with the same kind of predictions. And that's uh, all about these days. And so we call it, They Saw Our Day. And that's what it'll be about here today. And Lance has just finished a, a stay in the hospital, as many of you do know, where there was very little hope that he would come out alive. And it's been really, if you wonder if there are miracles that take place in this day and age, I can tell you, due to faith and prayers, Lance is alive today and his recovery has been almost remarkable. Uh, many doctors tell me they shake their heads and say, I, I can't believe this. I saw him. I did not think he would come out of that hospital alive. So to have him here now says to me that faith and prayers are still being heard and it's very important. So Lance, we'd like to welcome you. Well, thank you very much. It's uh, really a pleasure and a privilege to be here this evening and be able to uh, talk about something that's become very important to me, near to dear to my heart, as uh, I have studied more and more about uh, uh, some of the prophetic views of our day and time and of the future. And it's been uh, most fascinating. I think tonight you'll find as I have in my research, that this is probably the most incredible story I have ever heard. It is uh, absolutely fascinating. In fact, I was just down uh, a week and a half ago down in Los Angeles uh, doing an interview. I was telling them the story, and the talk show host uh, stopped me about 10 minutes into it. He says, wait a minute. He says, I've just got to ask you. He says, is this really true? I said, it sure is. And he says, this is the most incredible thing I've ever heard. He says, the world's got to hear about this. I said, well, we're trying. <laughs> so... I hope tonight you'll feel the same as, as we do about the wonderful experiences that uh, cultures all over the earth have, have had in, in this experience. Uh, I'd like to share with you, a lot of people have asked me, so why, you know, what gave you such an interest in this? And I, I guess that's kind of a twofold answer. Let me tell you first, I uh, purchased a motorbike for a few of my sons. And on Christmas afternoon, we went out to the garage to just start. We weren't going to ride it. We were just going to try to start it. And uh, we couldn't get things started. My neighbor came over and adjusted the carburetor and a few things and said, why don't you just drive down your driveway and see if it's running? All right. I said, okay. So I drove it down the driveway into the road, started to turn around, and hit a patch of ice. It went one way. I stuck my leg out to try to catch me, and it just split me in two. Fractured my hip, ruptured a disc in my back. Well, they hauled me up to the hospital, and that night they did surgery on my hip. And two days later my lungs began to fill up with blood clots. And my left lung filled completely full of blood clots and quit working. And they had uh, just the, the highest amount of oxygen they could pump into me going in, and I was still suffocating. To make a long story short, my uh, other lung filled up with blood clots, developed two large abscesses and burst, and I was suddenly in a very life-threatening situation. I was in a coma for about six to seven weeks. My pancreas quit working. My body filled up with a real rare form of staph infection that spread from head to toe, and uh, I developed a disease called ARDS, uh, Adult Respiratory Distress Syndrome, which most people that get it are dead. And so I was in a very, very precarious situation. Uh, and as the doctors, uh, most of them said, you, you were a dead man. And uh, I want you to know tonight, though this is a different part of the story, I was a dead man. And during part of that time, 
of my coma, I literally passed out of my body into the spirit world. And the reason I bring that up tonight is I want to tell you that there is indeed a world after this. There is life after death. There is a God. And the world over there it has the most incredible peace you could ever possibly imagine. It was so powerful. You felt the love of God and that peace through everything and in everything. And it was a feeling that you would never want to leave. There were only two things in this world that made me want to come back. Nothing else mattered. One was my family. And the second was that I suddenly had a clear understanding of who I was and that I was not finished with why I'd been sent to this earth. Nothing else mattered. <laughs> I wasn't thinking about, well, I wonder what the stock market's doing today. <laughs> and I'm a big football fan. I wasn't wondering what the Super Bowl score was. And it was on while I was there. But what I was worried about was my children, my wife, my family. I remember literally going to my kids' classrooms and visiting them, going to see if they were okay. It went on week after week after week, and I started worrying, how are they doing through all this? I started wondering if I was going to make it back. <laughs> but my family was so important. And as I watched what was taking place, I realized the people of our country especially, and our world in general, they don't get it. We don't realize really what's important. We are really turning away to a large degree away from that which is really important in our lives. Well, when I came back, you know what I told my wife? <laughs> I told her, I said, I would do anything. I would do anything to get that peace back again. Well, I'm here to tell you tonight that that peace is possible. And one of the things that has fascinated me and one of the things I was literally told when I visited this other side was the day would come when that society of peace would be built on this land in this world. And that's the feeling that would be there. And I would do anything to have that feeling again. Well, I had a desire to study many of these things before this took place, but it has greatly increased since that time. But I have found out in my studies that it is not just the Hopi Indians that have that story. It is almost every single culture around this world. In the last uh, six months, and as well as the last three and a half years, as I did uh, interviews with a number of other cultures, I've had a chance to interview and communicate with people uh, through a multitude of Indian tribes, the Hopis, the Chippewa, the Cherokee, the Nez Perce, the Pueblo, the Mayans, the Aztecs, the Incas, the uh, Chippewa, all the Iroquois tribes. Then we had a chance to interview a Tibetan Lama who was the translator for the Dalai Lama for some period of time. What a fascinating experience to hear their story and their views the Hindus, the Muslims, the Japanese, the Jewish people. It's been absolutely fascinating to hear the correlation between all of it. And what have I come away with? I've come to a very definite belief and understanding. We're all from the same family. We all have a great opportunity that God, the, the great creator, has spoken to his children all over the world. And the story is the same. Well, I want to share with you some of those stories. And I think you'll find... The similarity and the correlation, fascinating. But I want to preface my remarks by saying, really, even though a lot of what we'll talk about tonight, there is a lot of destruction and, and prophecies of destruction, but this is really a message of hope. And there was very few individuals or tribes I spoke with that didn't have that feeling. It is a message of hope because if there was one thread or two or three threads that, that came through every single culture, one was the fact that there is a day of utter peace coming. Now, there were a little bit different prophecies and different versions of what they had been told, which was, made it more fascinating to add the different stories together. But a time of peace is coming after that time of destruction and purification, as most Indian tribes call it. And so I hope that tonight you'll take away from this a message of hope rather than of destruction. I had the opportunity uh, oh, about uh, three and a half years ago to start working with a book project we started writing Zion, Seeking the City of Enoch. Now, people have asked me, why, why that book? This is actually a historical novel. I mean, how many of you ever asked yourself the question, what would a society of peace be like? I think we all have at some time. <laughs> is it possible? 
And if so, what would the characteristics of such a society be? Well, that was our question. Uh, we started studying in ancient history, and there is a powerful story that exists about a city that did reach a utopian-type society called the City of Enoch. Uh, Dead Sea Scrolls and the Nag Hammadi Scrolls, as well as the Pseudepigrapha Collection, Apocryphal Collections, had a lot of information about the society. It is uh, really coming more and more to a forefront because of these new discoveries, these documents. But the story was so powerful, and, and the thing that was amazing to us was we found that uh, here existed a society that mirrored America. They were just full of the exact same problems that we have. And yet out of the chaos and out of the rubble that became uh, this uh, society called Shum, they self-destructed, uh, and God told them they would. <laughs> but out of that came forth, the, in my opinion, the most successful society of all history. Now, it's interesting because we, our goal was to start studying, all right, so what are the characteristics? Why did they make it? There have been hundreds of attempts throughout history to develop such. You look at the different attempts, even communism, and, and it was interesting as we started studying the different attempts, we found communism had a lot of similarities to what did work. But the major difference was with communism, they were forcing the people to be a part of something. They had to do what the government said with the system that they had in Enoch's time and in a number of other cultures that we have studied, the entire mode of it was one of liberty for the individual. They had complete choice and complete freedom to be a part of the society or not. And that made the whole difference. It made a major, major difference between the two different types. Well, it has been a fascinating discovery a great opportunity for us to, to piece the, the different pieces together. And this is why we had to put it into a novel form was the pieces were so far apart in all these different books, we kind of had to pull it together and we used a lot of truth, a lot of factual characters, but we had to weave some of the others in to pull the stories together to give the people an idea of what took place and what were the solutions. But we'll talk about a few of those solutions here at the end because I think that's important. But let me talk now, uh, as we were doing that uh, study, we began to study some of the other cultures around the world that we started hearing, hey, uh, do you know the Hopi Indians have some information about an ancient Zion-type society, a utopian society? No, I didn't know that. So we started making some contacts, and before long, we ended up down on the Indian Reservation in Hopi Land in Arizona. And that was a great experience. Uh, we really fell in love with the people there, wonderful, wonderful people. They were scared uh, of us to begin with, uh, and rightfully so. They're, they uh, tell us that they've had a lot of people who've come in and destroyed a lot of their sacred artifacts, taken uh, artifacts, uh, and destroyed that which is sacred to them. And so to begin with, they wondered whether we were there you know, for good or bad purposes. And, and uh, they told us, well, we'll give you about 10 minutes, 7 to 10 minutes. And about two hours later, we were saying, well, we really ought to go. And they're going, oh, no, no, no. What, what else do you want to ask? And so once they found out that we really were, were there to tell their true story, they were very open with us, and it was a wonderful experience. We met with uh, several different sets of Hopi elders as well as uh, just some of the Hopi people themselves and asked a lot of questions. And through that, let me tell you that their story. Now, also, I've had a chance to uh, interview a number of other individuals who have written books about the Hopis, etc. And so I had a chance to ask the Hopi elders while we were there, all right, now, is this correct? Is this correct? Because we really wanted to have the accurate story. Long ago, the Hopi people, they tell the story that their people were not native to this land. They actually came across the oceans in ships and came to this land. And that they uh, then settled on this continent, and they were a very fearsome people. The time came when they, as they said, we were converted under the great white spirit. And this occurred before what they called the great star appeared in the sky. Well, they were so converted that they took their weapons of war and they dug a hole and buried them in, in the earth and took an oath that they would never take them up again. When this took place, their enemies came upon them and began to slay them. They said so they fell down on the ground, uh, laid prostrate, began to pray to the creator that he would save them. And many of those who were killing them dropped their weapons and joined them and took the oath also. Well, they tell uh, after that time they went on a migration northward out uh, through a wilderness to a new place where they made their new home and they became tillers of the earth and crop growers. And they raised food for the armies that surrounded them who protected them because they had taken this oath to not take up weapons of war. To this day, they have tried to continue that promise. Uh, when their sons reach the age of 12, they give them a bow and arrow, and the arrows are blunt to remind them of that promise. They are not to take up weapons of war again. 
And so this is a very important promise. By the way, I did find a couple other tribes that also had this same uh, story. The Pueblos, who I had known from meeting with the Hopis, had this same story. They are cousins, as well as the uh, Nez Perce. But anyway, after this period of time, they continued to migrate northward until they came to where they live today. A uh, long time ago, the Creator called his children together, and he explained to them what he called the true life plan and explain to them how they should live uh, in order to live in peace and harmony. Told them that he would split them up into four colors of people and they would go throughout all the world. But the time would come when many of them would turn against the true life plan and would begin to uh, become at war with one another and, and to uh, not uh, associate one with another. And so he gave them some uh, important signs for them to be able to recognize their true brothers. He taught them a, a very specific handshake by which they would know their true brothers, as well as the fact that he taught them the sign of peace, which the, all people seem to know the Indian sign of peace. Now, interestingly enough, they said, we didn't ever say how. <laughs> so that was the white man. They brought that in. We, <laughs> we didn't ever say how. But uh, th that was the representation of their symbol for peace. Well, he told them that after they were scattered, the time would come when they would start coming back together again. And they would be able to recognize whether their brothers were keeping the true life plan by this handshake. They told me that when the Spaniards came upon the land, they went out to greet them and they took cornmeal and made a line in the sand and reached across the line to uh, give them the handshake. And they said instead he handed us a trinket. <laughs> they said we knew there was a time of great bloodshed ahead, <laughs> which of course is exactly what happened. They had been told long before that there was a good chance the white people that would come would not be keeping the true life plan and, and therefore war and other great catastrophes would take place. Well, about 2,000 years ago, I have uh, had several different dates. They do not have a recorded date of this. They say uh, several said 2,000 years ago. Others said as recently as 1,400 years ago. But in that time period, the day came when they were living in where they are in Arizona at this time in a place called Old Oribe, and that is the oldest continually inhabited settlement in North America. They said at that time, a man came out of heaven and appeared to them who was wearing a long white flowing robe, had a beard that was forked, had bluish green eyes, and he spoke of peace and taught them the original teachings or the true life plan again. At that time, he also greatly increased their productivity as far as their lifestyle, helped them to understand he gave them corn for one thing, that is the life stay of those people. And he taught them what they should do to live in peace and harmony with one another. Well, he stayed with them for a short period of time, and, and during that time period, he gave to them a set of stone tablets, which they have to this day. Now, I have not had a chance to see them personally, but I have interviewed three individuals who have. Now they claim that there's only five or six white men who have ever been given the privilege to see their stone tablets and so I was happy to just be able to interview a couple of them who had. But uh, most fascinating experiences, they called this individual the Masao. Now there was one village in uh, Hopi land that called him Masiwa and I, I found it very interesting that both of them uh, were very close to the name Messiah. Uh, their story fits so closely with the story of Jesus Christ, and many of them believe, yes, it was Jesus Christ. Many of them do not believe that. But uh, I guess I happen to be one that, that does believe that uh, from their story. He told them that he was the first and the last, and he told them that when he was ready to leave, they pleaded with him to stay, and he said, I must go unto my father, but I will come again. Well, there's so many similarities, you just have to start saying, whoa, wait a minute, <laughs> Is this, was this indeed uh, the same Jesus Christ? Well, in any case, he left with them these stone tablets, and he told them that he was going to give stone tablets also to the other color peoples of the world, the black, the yellow, and the white. And they shared their story with me, and they said that we have met and seen the plates that the Tibetans have, and, and they claim that the Tibetans are their cousins. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that as I talk about the Tibetan Lama and, and my interview with him in a moment. The Kikuyu tribe in Africa also, they said, to have a set of these stone tablets. And we have done interviews with a few people with the Kikuyu tribe. And then they claim that there is another set of stone tablets with the Swiss people, in a, with a group of people that live high in the uh, Swiss mountains. And they have never seen those, but they have been told that they have them. Now, to them, it was significant that each of the four groups lived high in the mountains, and that uh, that was part of uh, what precipitated who received the, the plates, I guess, or the, the uh, records. But 
these stone tablets contained the original teachings of the way they should live in peace, as well as prophecies of what would come from the time he left until the time he came again. Now, this was, uh, to them, uh, a wonderful statement in itself that he would come again. And he promised them that when he came again, he would live with them and help them build a society of utter peace here on this land. And they're anxiously awaiting that day to take place. Now, the, the prophecies that he gave to them and told them would take place before the time he came again are very, very interesting. And uh, most of them have been fulfilled. Almost every single one of them have been fulfilled at this point now. And let me just share a bunch of these that he did uh, give to them. He told them the time would come when the white man would come upon the land and would force them onto small parcels of land and lord over them. Indeed, that took place. And they lost many of their rights. He said that uh, they would uh, take away many of their customs and try to seek to take their traditions away from them, which certainly has happened. He told them that the white men would also bring a lot of good things with them, in which they would bring technology, which one thing would be that they would teach them how to bring running water right into their huts. Now, that was quite a miracle for the, <laughs> the Hopis because they live on three 600-foot high mesas, and the only water source in that whole area is a stream that runs down along the valley floor or down below. And so they would traverse back and forth all the way down and go get their buckets of water and take it back up. So to have running water, they thought that was quite a great thing. But he warned them. He said, never become too reliant upon it, for the day will come when that water will become filthy and will make you greatly sick or die if you drink it. Uh, second of all, he told them that they would develop a system of power by which the, the people could just touch the side of their hut and it would light up. And they thought, wow, <laughs> that's great. But he also warned them about this. He told them the world would be shaken three times before it came, the first two with one hand, the third time with both hands. But he told them that in that third shaking, that power would be taken away. And so if they became totally reliant upon it, they would suffer. Well, because of that, there is about 20% or a little bit more than that of the Hopis who to this day refuse to have running water or electricity, fearing the technology rather than preparing for the other end of it. Most of the other Hopis have decided, now nah, we can use the technology, but let's, let's be prepared for the opposite as well. Well, that was quite an interesting set of prophecies to them, they thought. And as the Mossau continued with his uh, prophecies to them, he told them, as I mentioned, that there would be three great shakings of the earth that would take place. The first two would be less powerful, uh, as if with one hand, but the, the uh, third would be with two hands. And he explained to them that they could avoid that third shaking if the people would turn back to God and would keep the commandments he had given them. Well, the first shaking, he gave them some prophecies to watch for that would take place around that time period, and they would know that the first shaking was about to take place. The first thing that he told them to watch for was that they would see carriages that were pulled by animals, and then the carriages suddenly would no longer be pulled by animals. They'd go all by themselves. And then they were to look for, as they called it, uh, spinning wheels with voices coming out from behind them. Well, to them, that was the covered wagons. Uh, the, the spinning wheels go, rolling over the land and voices coming out of the wagon. Uh, he told them that these carriages would soon be connected together and they would go down a line of metal and smoke would be coming out the top. Certainly fit the, the railroad system that came in. And then he told them that the carriages would lift off the ground and begin to fly all on their own and leave a trail of dust in the sky. Well, the airplane, the Model T, all these things came around the time of the First World War. And so they believed that the First World War was that first great shaking. Uh, another one that he told them would take place would be they would see a black ribbon that would start to cross all across the continent uh, from one end to the other, back and forth. And these little bugs would go back and forth <laughs> on this black ribbon. Uh, VW, I, I guess, is the, the bug, right? <laughs> uh, but uh, clearly the black ribbon uh, stretching across would be our road system. Another one that I thought was fascinating, the way he actually described it, was a cobweb that would cover the earth, and people would speak into it, and it'd be heard clear on the other side of the world. And you think about what, how you would maybe describe our telephone system, or internet system for that matter, uh, to someone that many years ago. <laughs> be, I, I can't think of a better explanation of what it'd be. So clearly the cobweb came as well. They would uh, also see at that time the signs of the second uh, shaking to take place. They would see a people rise up in power that were governed by a sign or led by a sign that he drew on a rock 
And they, I've seen the pictures of the rock, uh, and the sign is clearly the swastika. Now, to them, that was quite significant because their symbol for peace is an inversion of the swastika sign. And so I, I thought it was uh, pretty significant that you'd invert peace to bring war. Well, clearly Germany had that sign, and he told them that they would join with the people of the rising sun, and they would bring about this second great shaking of the world. Now, the second great shaking was to end with a gourd of ashes being dropped from one of these carriages in the sky. And where it landed, it would destroy everything where it landed, and nothing would grow for some time or be alive in that area for some time. Uh, very uh, great description of what took place with Hiroshima and our bomb. One bad note to that, though, was he told them that the white nation that dropped that gourd of ashes in that second shaking would have a gourd of ashes dropped upon them in the third shaking, if the third shaking were to take place. Now, he gave to them a, a number of other signs to watch for. One of them was a sign that they were told when they saw this sign, they would know it was time to go out and let the people know about all these prophecies. They were told to keep them to themselves until this period of time. Interesting, the Incas also had this same story. Uh, they said that uh, they were told that they were not to go to the world and share their prophecies or their vision of this golden age of peace, as they called it, until they saw a particular sign. The Incas, their sign was there would be an earthquake that would take place, and the land would open up, and down below there would be a temple of gold. In 1949, the very thing took place. High in the mountains in Cusco, Peru, uh, 14,000 feet up, <laughs> there was an earthquake. It split the uh, mountain open. And underneath a monastery in Cusco, there was a temple that had much gold in its working, as well as silver. Now, this happened to be one of the temples or uh, one of the deposits that Francisco Pizarro was looking for. Uh, when he came to the Americas, he went to the Incas and had heard about this temple of gold and was seeking to find it as well as many of their treasures of gold. The Inca people, they wonder how in the world Francisco Pizarro ever conquered an entire nation of Incas who were very civilized and they had great technology at that time for their day and time. Here was a great nation that were actually destroyed by 180 men. Francisco Pizarro came in with 180 men and destroyed the capital and it turned out that the reason was because as he came in, a white bearded man, it was Wirachoa, who they thought he was, and he came in to their city and they believed that he was the great white god who had promised him that he would come again. And so they opened up to him. Well, when their king found out it was not indeed the, their great white god returning, it was too late. They imprisoned him and he refused to tell them where their caches of gold and other treasures were. And so they ransacked the entire civilization, destroying their buildings, destroying the people, burning everything in sight uh, nearly, and a lot of sacred uh, records as well as uh, many edifices they had uh, constructed were destroyed through that raid. Interestingly enough, they had saved these large caches of gold and silver, they told later. The reason they had saved these and buried them was that the great white god had told them when he returned, he would join with them in building a society of peace, and in it would be a great temple, and that they were saving the silver and gold to help build that city and to build that temple. Montezuma also told that same story. Here was Montezuma of the Aztecs, uh, who had formerly been known as the Toltecs, and the uh, Toltecs had had some mighty cities in uh, Central America, and the Aztecs were led at that time by Montezuma. When Cortez came in, once again, they thought he was the great white god, Quetzalcoatl. Interestingly enough, uh, I mean, there, there are all these different names for this great white god. Most of them translated mean feathered serpent. For example, in the Quetzalcoatl, Quetzal was a, a type of bird. The feathers could only be worn by the kings and by royalty. It was basically to them the lord of the heavens. And the Quetzalcoatl was the snake. And to them, the snake had great power and was uh, lord of the underworld or the earth. And so to them, the name Quetzalcoatl meant Lord of Heaven and Earth. And Kukulkan, who is the Mayan name uh, for this being that came to them, 
also means the same, Buku Mats, which is another name. We found just a, a lot of different names uh, that uh, this individual was called by. But the stories seem to correlate with every different culture about this great white God coming and visiting them, teaching them. In some cases, and, and this was fascinating, was we found that the Mayans and the Aztecs told us that uh, when he came, he not only taught them about a way of life, but he taught them the arts, he taught them sciences, he taught them astronomy, he taught them how to grow cottons of many different colors. Uh, one of the things that we've been studying lately was the original records of the Spanish uh, conquistadores as well as the monks and fathers that came over. Interestingly enough, they tell the stories of coming into cities where there were cottons growing with many different colors, not just white. Of course, uh, some of these cities were magnificent in their structure. They destroyed them because they wanted to wipe out the memory of this Quetzalcoatl or Kukulkan because at the time they thought he was pagan. it was a pagan worshiping. I mean, here was a feathered serpent they were worshiping. They didn't understand. They actually were worshiping a great white god. And afterwards, I read a couple of the Spanish fathers' quotes from their journals saying, boy, I wish I hadn't done that. <laughs> I wish I hadn't destroyed all these records. One, one particular individual had burned an entire, a, a huge library of codices, volumes and volumes that would have told us about these people, but they were all obliterated. Anyway, the story was fascinating as all of them told the story that the time would come when this, this great white god would come back and every single one of them tell the story that they would build a society of complete peace at that time when he came back. And they're anxiously awaiting that return. Now, going back to the Hopi story as uh, their story uh, so correlates with so many of the other tribes, he told them that the time would come when they would see this sign, that they would see a house of glass that would come up, uh, it would be built on the east coast of Turtle Island. Now, Turtle Island is the name that a number of the Indian tribes used to describe America. Now, here's the reason why. They had also had another prophecy that when the white men came on to land, they would look like turtles. That they would be human, but they would have shells like turtles. Now, you think about the uh, armor that they wore, it certainly would resemble that of a turtle. And so it became known as Turtle Island to a number of these different uh, Indian cultures, which was interesting. So he told them that they would see a house of mica or glass that would be built on the east coast of Turtle Island in which uh, all of the countries of the world would send representatives to this house and they would talk of peace and seek to bring peace to the world. Well, he warned them that those who came to that building, that many of them would only talk of peace and that their pretenses were for power and gain only and to not trust many of those who were involved with it. But anyway, they were told that when they saw that house of glass, uh, they were to go, uh, they were sent a delegation back to that building and deliver a message to the world of what would take place if the people did not turn back to the great God. Well, in 1959, they saw a newspaper with a picture of the United Nations building in New York City. And they said, there it is, <laughs> the house of glass, it's here. And so they sent back a delegation. It was actually a delegation of six men composed of uh, several different Indian tribes. And they went back and uh, they petitioned to go in and deliver the message and were refused three times. Uh, the third time, actually, they had a vote and gave the uh, veto vote to the United States. The United States said no. And that man's name was Henry Cabot Lodge, and they have a, a hatred for him up to this day because of, of that fact. However, it's interesting to note, uh, uh, just the other day I found that uh, there's a, one of the great Hopi elders, a man named Thomas Bayanka, and in 1992, he was allowed to go back to the UN and deliver their message. But uh, when they were refused, they wrote it down and, and tried to pass it on in writing, but they don't know that whether it actually was ever read. But they tried to warn the people that the time had come when that third great shaking would occur if the people did not change. Now, the Mossau gave the uh, Hopis a uh, number of different prophecies to watch for that would be signs leading up to this third great shaking. And these are very interesting. One of the signs was that they would see men who would start saying, I know more than the great creator. I want to be a woman. And they would change themselves to be a woman. There would be women who would say, I know more than the great creator. I want to be a man. They would change themselves to be a man. The Hopi elders told me, they said, we thought, how in the world could that ever happen? They said, then we saw Boy George, and we knew, okay, that's happened. <laughs> it's taken place. <laughs> so that, that sign was fulfilled. <laughs> Another one that they were told was that women would start wearing men's clothing, and that women would start raising their skirts higher and higher until they began to expose the parts that were most sacred to their body. And clearly, uh, our magazines are, are full of it across this country. They were told that the time would come when the world would seem as if time would be speeding up. And boy, what an accurate description of our day today. 
He told them that time would speed up so much that families would no longer spend time together, that grandparents would not take time for their grandchildren or their children, and parents wouldn't take no time for their children, and that the sanctity of the family would be destroyed. Now, this is a prophecy that I think every single tribe I've talked with and culture, including the Hindus, the Muslims, the Buddhists, every one of them had prophecies that the time when the destructions would occur would correlate with families being destroyed. Powerful message to us, I think, today. Another thing that they were told would be, and this was also a sign that they were about to start receiving some of their rights and freedoms back, and that was that they would see an eagle that would rise up off the ground, fly up into the skies, and land on the moon. And they said, we thought, how in the world are we going to know if an eagle lands on the moon? We can't see up there. They said, and then there we were, sitting in 1969 with the rest of the world. We heard, Houston, the eagle has landed. And we thought, oh, <laughs> the eagle's there. And the, this uh, Hope Yeller said to me, he says, notice Sputnik could not make it. <laughs> <laughs> Apollo 1 could not make it. <laughs> he says, had to be called eagle <laughs> before it could make it. I said, well, you're right. <laughs> That's really amazing. He told them that there would be a great commotion within the nature that there would be great tornadoes, uh, hurricanes, uh, floods, there would be tidal waves, there would be, the seasons would begin changing to the point where the Chippewa and the Okanagans also had a, a story that people would get to the point where they couldn't even plant their crops. This morning I was talking with a good friend of mine in Ashton and they said, you know, we can't even, we haven't been able to put our, our potatoes in yet. Uh, whoa, <laughs> that certainly fits with what uh, we've been studying. And clearly, all the elements have, are in commotion. Interestingly, the, one of the Hopi elders said to me, he said, El Nino, heck. I said, what do you mean by that? And he says, oh, everybody blames everything on El Nino. He says, it's not El Nino. And I said, well, I think I agree with you, but what do you mean by your statement? He says, he said, it's not El Nino that's causing the commotions of the world and of nature. He said, it is the sins of the people. He says, Mother Earth is shaking and quivering and quaking with the wickedness of the children on earth. He said she is seeking to rid herself of that wickedness. Uh, wow, that's a powerful, powerful statement. And very clearly, these catastrophes are occurring. Uh, in connection with that, there was one tribe that had a very interesting prophecy about these carriages that would fly in the sky, and the time would come when the carriages would begin falling from the sky. It was the Asanabe uh, tribe. It seems like more and more frequency that is taking place. But in any case, uh, these prophecies began to be fulfilled, and some of the others that he told them of was that they would see the sea or the ocean would turn black, and the living things in it would begin to die around it. Now, they believed that that was certainly the oil spills, uh, such as what took place in Alaska. They also said that morality would be gone uh, from amongst the people. Corruption of the white man's government. This was something that they talked quite a bit about, the fact that the white man's government would become so corrupt that no one could trust them. And that certainly has taken place in many ways. They were told that the, there would be a black people who would come upon the land and that they would have two uprisings, one for their rights and freedom and second for power. Now the second one, uh, they don't believe has taken place yet, but they believe that will be part of the third shaking. They told them that there would be villages that would be built that would be so high you could not see outside of it. And when that third shaking took place, these villages would start to tumble down upon the people. And uh, the people inside these large villages could, you could not see out would, would be destroyed. Told them that man would find the blueprint of life and that they would begin making their own animals. Now, can you imagine <laughs> a statement like that uh, that many years ago? And now we watch, uh, you know, genetic breeding as well as cloning. Schools would become an enemy of the people, that they would seek to change the teachings and traditions of the people. And that, uh, I was telling some people the other day, in fact, I think I mentioned this on our radio show, that uh, not too long ago I was trying to do a, a search on a CD encyclopedia for some information about Lafayette and uh, about, uh, oh, two or three of the other uh, founding fathers. They weren't there. Nothing, no mention. And I thought, wow, it's just being wiped away, our history, and very, very sad. One other sign that, that would be of interest was the fact that there would be an alignment of the planets, and that when the planets aligned, it would be a sign that the third shaking was imminent. It was, would take place at any time at that point. The last other sign that they mentioned was that they would see a house that would be thrown up into the sky, and it would stay there and men would go up and start living in it. 
And I said to them, ooh, Mir Space Station? I said, yeah, that's our interpretation. They said, also could be Skylab. One of their prophecies actually told that this house would then fall from the sky and look like a blue star falling from heaven. Now, they said uh, that they have talked to observatories in Australia that said that from the angle of Australia, when Skylab fell in, 70, I think it was 1979, that it looked like a blue star falling from the heavens. And so that would be a, also a fulfillment of that prophecy. There would be a great famine that would occur as part of this third shaking. And he told them, the Mossau told them that they should store food for a period of three seasons. I asked him, what you, what's your interpretation of that, three seasons? They said, well, uh, there's various interpretations. Some that say that's three years. Others that say, hey, we have more than one growing season, so it's three seasons. He said, in any case, we store food. And uh, when they have a wedding, instead of giving them, as he said, we don't give them toasters and microwave ovens, <laughs> so we give them food. <laughs> and I said, well, you're a lot smarter than we are. <laughs> and, uh, and so they, they give them uh, bags of corn and corn flour for storing for that time when the famine would come. Money means very little to most of the Hopis. They were told that they should not seek after riches, and, but should seek the quiet life, the meek life, and they have done so. And you look at where they live, and clearly that is the case for so many of them. In that third shaking, there would be riots that would erupt from coast to coast, and war would break out, and it would look like our land was about to be overthrown, and a gourd of ashes would be dropped, and this third shaking would be started by the red people, is a country led by a red sign. Now, I've seen the uh, drawing of it, and uh, I have to tell you, it certainly could be interpreted as the Chinese flag. In correlation with that, I'm going to share with you a couple other prophecies. I think I've found now five different cultures that have prophetic views that the time would come when the bear and the yellow people would come together and attack our country. And you think about the bear being the sign of Russia, and uh, some of the revelations have come out recently about some of their work together, and it does possibly fit. Well, during this uh, period of conflict on our land, they were told that uh, it would look like we were about to be overthrown when a group from the West would rise up and come forward and save the country from destruction. And they were told that that group from the West would be their true white brothers, and they were to join with them, and Mossau would return. And what they call the Bahani would come from heaven, and Bahani is interpreted the people of light. People of light would come down and join with them and help them in creating a society of peace on this land. Now, as we talked about that society of peace, it was really interesting to discuss that. They believe that time will come when it will completely cover this continent and that it will be an entire nation of freedom. And they said, we believe that we will be sent throughout the world to bring the true Hopis to our land to live with us and to join with us. Are you saying then you just believe it's just Hopis? They said, oh, no. What I mean is the truly peaceful ones of the earth, because Hopi means peaceful one. They said, we will go throughout the world, and we will bring them to join with us in this society. Their vision of that day and time is so masterful and wonderful. It is so neat to look at the different prophecies of the different Indian tribes as they have told about what would take place in that day and time. It is just uh, incredible as they talk about the technology that would come forward. Uh, one of the statements uh, from one of the tribes was the fact that that day would be so glorious that the very blades of grass would erupt early from the soil to be able to see the day. Uh, what a great description of a time of peace. During that time, we would see new types of technology developed, uh, new power that would be made from the uh, magnetic field of the earth, is what they said. And there would become a new type of construction and building as well. And that this new type of building would make the architecture of this city much, much greater than what the world had ever seen. New flowers and trees of different kinds that uh, no one had seen before that were a variety of colors that uh, we probably don't have in our world today. That's most of the Hopi's story and what they shared with me about uh, their vision of the future. Uh, there's some sad days ahead, if they're right, and I believe they are. And there's also some, some great, great days. The Caro Indians, the Caros are a branch of the Incas, and probably the only Incas that are left, actually. And they said that this time of peace, they were told it would last for a thousand years, a, an entire millennium. And so they're waiting for that day and time. The Tibetans, now, here's an interesting story. Lopsang Rabke is the name of this uh, Tibetan Lama that I had a chance to uh, 
interview, and what a wonderful man. I was so impressed with him. He's uh, right now doing a professorship at UCLA, and uh, he's a doctor in psychology as well as uh, a Tibetan monk and lama, the translator for the Dalai Lama for a period of time. I told him, I said, you know, the, the Hopis tell a very fascinating story about you guys, and they say that you are their cousins. I said, is that the same thing you believe? He says, he said, yes, yes, we do. He says, it goes back to a time in which uh, about 2,000 years ago, we had a set of prophecies that were given to our people, and the time period would correlate with what the Hopis say their experience was. And one of the prophecies was that the time would come when part of their people would fly on iron birds east. He says, now you have to understand, east to us would be the United States and Europe. He says, and we generally interpret it America because the rest of the prophecy was that they would fly east and come to join with their true red-faced brothers. And they would uh, join in building this uh, land of peace or the society of peace. And I, I thought, well, that's great. <laughs> that sounds like that fits very well with what the uh, Hopis as well as other Indian tribes have told us. I said, what are some of the other prophecies? Now, they tell the story that a long time ago there was a man that came amongst them that many believed to be a god. He said, most of us don't believe that today. We believe that he was an enlightened one, as in their belief at this time is that there isn't necessarily a god as a creator, but that we do have spirits or souls that do live after this life and that we continue to pass on and reincarnate into other individuals. Their belief of the Dalai Lama is the fact that he'd be a reincarnation of many enlightened ones. Does that mean that you believe that these spirits of these enlightened ones work through him or in him? And you stop for a minute. Good question. <laughs> I guess both. But uh, and I thought that was interesting. They were told a long time ago in these prophecies that the time would come when there would be great upheaval throughout the cosmos, as he referred to it, and nature would begin to have great troubles. There would be disasters worldwide. We went through the very same stories of the earthquakes, the famine, the droughts, the, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, then he said that also, and this obviously was key to me, was the fact that he said we were told that families would be destroyed. The sanctity of the family would be destroyed, and people would no longer have time for their children. Now, he shared also that to them, one of the most important signs of the disintegration of society would be that morals and integrity would be lost. In fact, the way he worded it was morality would be thrown to the wind. Their leaders also would become more and more corrupt. Now, explain to me that they believe that this is very much a cycle and that at the end of each cycle, a time of purification occurs. I said, so do you believe also in a time of, of a golden age or a time when there will be great peace? And he says, oh yes. He says, that will be the beginning of that next cycle. And in that cycle, mankind will have turned back to the right teachings uh, that are truths from the beginning of time and that they'll begin to live them. And so they also see this view. Now, it was interesting to talk to him about the fact that they had a golden age at one time as well in their history. It was fascinating to see that the characteristics of every single one of these societies that made it were the same, uh, very much the same. The Tibetans also told of a time when... Uh, their people would be destroyed as well as the religion, and it would be reestablished in the country of the red-faced people. And one of the most important aspects of survival to them through the dark times would be the re-strengthening of family ties and trying to solidify that. So once again, that theme comes very strong. I want to share a story with you uh, that was uh, shared by the Guatemalan Mayans in which they told about a time when uh, this great white god, who they called uh, Gukumats, was amongst their people, and he was in a village. A little girl came running into the village and was, had a uh, claw marked across her face, clothes torn, and was bleeding and crying. And the uh, Gukumats picked uh, the girl up and uh, carried her down to a stream at the edge of the village washed her off and brought her back up and she was completely whole. And the people fell down on the ground and began to worship him and one of the villagers uh, stood up and pointed back behind the great god and, and uh, he turned around and there was the jaguar that had clawed this child and, and the the child. And all the people began to shake and quiver and figure, oh wow, he's going to be ripped apart by the jaguar. And instead he turned and he raised his arm to the peace sign of the Indians and said to the jaguar, soft-footed chief, 
in thy jungle setting, come close to receive my Father's blessing. Forgiven thou art for the pangs of thy hunger, go and clothe the little children no more. I thought that was just a wonderful story about uh, this man's love for not only the little children, but for all God's creations, for the animals as well. Another Indian shared the story uh, with me. This is a Cherokee man, and he said that, to my knowledge, I, he said, I've never heard this from any other Indian tribe, but he said that their Cherokee people tell the story of a time when this great prophet or white brother came up among their people, and he said that this man actually had 12, he called them disciples with him, and that they followed him wherever he went. And he said that he began going out into the forest, and these 12 went with him. And as he was in the forest, he came upon a fawn that was uh, by itself. And he turned to the fawn and said, uh, where is your mother? And the fawn turned its head, and he looked down the pathway, and there was this doe laying dead in the middle of the pathway, having been thrashed by uh, some type of mountain lion. But anyway, he said that uh, the great white being walked down to the mother and knelt next to it, and began to softly caress its side, and as he rubbed across the animal's body, all of the wounds healed up. And suddenly the doe raised up and began to walk away. And these 12 turned to him and said, Why are you wasting your strength on an animal that is dead? And he said to them that uh, there cannot be too many good deeds. Such is the manner of compassion. A lost lamb in my father's business is as important as saving a nation. One need not choose between them. More precious in my father's eyes is a good deed than the most exquisite jewel. What a great statement. Powerful story. Well, the Indian tribes have some wonderful stories about this man. And as some of the stories, I have to say, uh, from the details around it, it would more appear that it may have been one of these 12 disciples or someone else that came amongst them, uh, judging from the circumstances and some of the information about it. Let me uh, now go to a different set of prophecies. And this was something that uh, we came upon not too long ago that is uh, really something. This was given by a woman named uh, Ursula Sonthel. Some of you may know of her and of her prophecies. She was born in 1488 in uh, Narsborough, England, and was born actually in a cave on the side of a river, and thunder cracked and the smell of sulfur was smelled at the time of birth, and everybody thought, oh, she's a witch, she's a witch. Well, this woman had the gift to be able to see into the future, and because of that, the time came when she was burned at the stake for heresy and supposed witchcraft. However, the stories, as far as I've been able to research her life, and it turns out they do have a museum there at that cave where she was born and lived, and they take a lot of the school classes in England to go there on visits now uh, because of the fact that clearly most of her prophecies have come to pass and are taking place. They say that she was uh, quite an uncomely-looking woman, had a very large nose that was warded, and so it even gave more to the fact of being a witch in that time. She didn't think she'd ever be able to marry, but eventually did marry a man named Toby Shipton, and therefore she was called Mother Shipton. She never was able to have a child. Her husband died, so she spent most of her life actually going out and serving and helping other people and taking care of other people's children. Well, with her gift of being able to see in the future, she wrote these down in poetic verse, and they are really something. Listen to this. A carriage without horse will go. Disaster fills the world with woe. In London, Primrose Hill shall be in the center hold of Bishop's See. Around the world, men's thoughts will fly quick as the twinkling of an eye. Could be the internet. <laughs> and water shall great wonders do. How strange, and yet it shall come true. Through towering hills, proud men shall ride. No horse or ass will be by their side. Beneath the water, men shall walk, shall ride, shall sleep, shall even talk. And in the air, men shall be seen in white and black and even green. Uh, can you imagine what she must have thought when she was watching these people walking under the water and sleeping and talking, etc.? Uh, a great man then shall come and go, for prophecy declares it so. In water, iron shall then float, as easy as a wooden boat. Gold shall be seen in stream and in stone, in land that is yet unknown. Now, this was the early 1500s, so at that time, America was barely discovered. A house of glass shall come to pass in England, but alas, alas, a war will follow with the work where dwells the pagan and the Turk. These states will lock in fiercest strife and seek to take each other's life, 
When north shall thus divide the south, an eagle shall build in the lion's mouth. You think about the United States being the eagle and Great Britain being the lion. Then tax and blood and cruel war shall come to every humble door. Three times shall lovely sunny France be led to play a bloody dance before the people shall be free. Three tyrant rulers shall she see. Three rulers in succession be, each springs from different dynasty. Then when the fiercest strife is done, England and France shall be as one. For in those wondrous far-off days, the women shall adopt a craze to dress like men. Sounds like the Hopis. <laughs> to dress like men and trousers wear and to cut off the locks of their hair. They'll ride astride with brazen brow as witches do on broomsticks now. And roaring monsters with man atop do seem to eat the verdant crop. Any farmers in here? <laughs> Sounds like a combine to me. <laughs> and men shall fly as birds do now and give away the horse and plow. There'll be a sign for all to see. Be sure, for it certain will be. Love shall die and marriage cease. And nations wane as babes decrease. Wow. <coughs> and wives shall fondle cats and dogs, and men shall much the same live as hogs. In 1926, build houses light of straw and sticks, for then shall mighty wars be planned, and fire and sword shall sweep the land. When pictures seem alive with movements free, must have been the TV, <laughs> when boats like fishes swim beneath the sea, when men like birds shall soar the sky, then half the world, deep drenched in blood, shall die. For those who live the century through, which would be our time, in fear and trembling, this shall do. Flee to the mountains and the dens, to bogs and forests and wild fens. For storms will rage and oceans roar when Gabriel stands on sea and shore. And as he blows his wondrous horn, old worlds die and new be born. A fiery dragon will cross the sky. Six times before this earth shall die, mankind will tremble and frighten be for the six heralds in this prophecy. For seven days and seven nights, man will watch this awesome sight. The tides will rise beyond their kin to bite away the shores, and then the mountains will begin to roar, and earthquakes split the plain to shore, and flooding waters rushing in will flood the lands with such a din that mankind cowers in muddy fen and snarls about his fellow men. He bears his teeth and fights and kills and secretes food in secret hills. And ugly in his fear, he lies to kill marauders, thieves, and spies. Man flees in terror from the floods and kills and rapes and lies in blood and spilling blood by mankind's hand will stain the bitter many lands. And when the dragon's tail is gone, man forgets and smiles and carries on to ply himself, but too late, too late, for mankind has earned his deserved fate. His masked smile, his false grandeur, will serve the gods their anger stewer, and they will send the dragon back to light the sky. His tail will crack upon the earth and rend the earth, and man shall flee, king, lord, and serf. But slowly they are routed out to seek diminishing water spout, and men will die of thirst before the ocean rides to mount the shore. And lands will crack and rend anew. You think it strange. It will come true. And in some far-off distant land, some men, such a tiny band, will leave their solid mount and span the earth, those few to count, who survives this and then begins the human race again. But not on land already there, but on ocean's bed, stark, dry, and bare. Not every soul on earth will die as the dragon's tail goes sweeping by. Not every land on earth will sink, but these will wallow in stench and stink of rotting bodies of beast and man, of vegetation crisped on the land. But the land that rises from the sea will be dry and clean and soft and free of mankind's dirt and therefore the source of man's new dynasty. And those that live will ever fear the dragon's tail for many years, but time erases memory. You think it's strange, but it will be. Now, th this is an interesting part, I think, in correlation with the time of, of peace. And before the race is built anew, a silver serpent comes to view and spews out men of like unknown to mingle with the earth, now grown cold from its heat, and then these men can enlighten the minds of future man to intermingle and show them how to live and love and thus endow the children with the second sight and natural things so that they might grow graceful, humble, and when they do, the golden age will start anew. The dragon's tail is but a sign for mankind's fall and man's decline. 
And before this prophecy is done, I shall be burned at the stake at one. My body singed, my soul set free. You think I utter blasphemy. You're wrong. These things have come to me. This prophecy will come to be. She put one other short prophecy into a jar. Let me just read it quickly as well. The signs will be there for all to read. When man shall do most heinous deed, man will ruin kinder lives by taking them as to their wives. A murder foul and brutal deed when man will only think of greed. A man shall walk as if asleep. And he does not look, he may not peep. And iron men the tail shall do. And iron cart and carriage too. The king shall false promise make. And talk just for talking's sake. That does sound like a few political leaders I've heard. <laughs> and nations plan horrific war. The like has never seen before. And taxes rise and lively down. And nations wear perpetual frown. Yet greater sign there be to see as man nears the latter part of the century. Three sleeping mountains gather breath and spew out mud and ice and death. An earthquake swallow town and town and lands as yet to me unknown. And Christian one fights Christian two and nations sigh, yet nothing do. And yellow men great power gain from the mighty bear with whom they've lain. These mighty tyrants fail to do, they fail to split the world in two. But from their acts, a danger bred, an ague leaving many dead, and physics finds no remedy, for this is worse than leprosy. Oh, many signs for all to see the truth of this true prophecy. Well, that's Elizabeth Sonthel, powerful vision of our day and time. So many of them so accurate, you have to say, well, I'm afraid some of these others we better watch for. I wanted to uh, quickly mention also Nostradamus, obviously his quatrains have been studied for years and years. He certainly is another one who saw what was taking place in our day and time. As we talk about they saw our day, he clearly was another one that, that did see our day. I want to talk about another individual that fits in with many of these other cultures. This was uh, also one of the greatest stories I think I've ever come upon in this research. The story is about a man named uh, Deganawida. There's a lot of questions about where he came from. Some of the sources I searched, including encyclopedias, actually said, well, he was claimed to have been a god. They didn't know where he came from. He suddenly came upon the Iroquois people. Others said that he was of Huron birth. The truth, I guess, may not be known for a period of time. Deganawida came to the Iroquois nations in the 1500s, and they called him the peacemaker. And Deganawida taught the people of a way to live in peace and harmony. Now, when he came to these different nations of the Iroquois, these were the Seneca, the Mohawk, the Oneida, Onondaga, the Cayuga, and the Tuscarora, many of the people accepted his message right off and thought, whoa, this is great. Taught them what he called the great law of justice, set up a system of checks and balances, rules of procedures, limits of power, and with a major stress on individual liberty. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> This man went amongst the people trying to convince them of the importance of this plan of peace. And most of the people were very accepting of what he had to say, but some of them were not so much. And they said to him, all right, there's an old hermit that lives in the forest that is a beast. And he is an angry man. And if you can go and convert this man to the plan, then we will be certain that all of the tribes will accept this. So he went to this man named Hiawatha. And Hiawatha had, had his daughters slaughtered uh, in an Indian raid, and he was very, very upset because of what had taken place to him. And because of it, uh, he had rejected society and had great anger. Deganawida went to Hiawatha and shared with him his plan for peace and cried with him. And when they were finished, Hiawatha was completely converted unto this plan. And he left at that moment with Deganawida and traveled with him through the remainder of Deganawida's time with these people, which was quite a period of time. It was said that Deganawida told the people that he was slow of speech from the time he was born and had a stuttering problem. Because of that, he asked Hiawatha to be his spokesperson and to speak in his place in many situations. Well, as the people came together, they formed this, what they called the Iroquois Confederacy and had what they called the Iroquois Constitution or League. When they came upon problems in their life, they were to seek first for help from their immediate family. 
And then if that was not enough, they turned to their extended family in the longhouses. And if that was not enough, their extended family from there was their entire tribe. And if that was not enough, they would turn to the Confederacy or the League. Well, it was a system that worked. And they said that uh, when the European settlers started coming into our land and found this Iroquois nation, it was so powerful that it was really a force to be reckoned with. When they came in, they started breaking the Iroquois Confederacy apart. Uh, they started taking sides, some with the Americans, some with the Europeans, some with the French. It became a situation where it eventually destroyed the Iroquois Confederacy. But the people for a, a long period of time, a hundred or so years, lived in this league under the concepts that Deganawita taught to these people. And he told them that uh, one of the aspects that was really key to their society was that all people had to be equal in stature, that no one could be greater than another. And one of the most important aspects of that was men and women, that women had as much equality in their society as the men did. In fact, they had what they called the Council of Grandmothers. Now, they would nominate and elect, in a sense, I guess, the representatives from each of the tribes. They, interestingly enough, had 50 representatives and each had one vote in this confederacy. Now here's a part where uh, I thought was uh, most interesting. They, they had to make decisions by unanimous consent, by a consensus. A majority would not do, and they would continue to meet until they could reach a consensus. Then the decisions were then taken to the Council of Grandmothers. Because of their compassion and sensitivity and meekness, they believed that the woman had the ability to help them in making those final decisions. And so therefore, the men being the representatives, but the women would have a final say on what would take place. He taught them some very important principles on which to base their life. The day came when he came to the people and he told them, I must leave. The Creator has called me to another work. But before I leave, I want to speak to you one last time. And so they brought the people together on the Bay of Quinte, which is near the Lake Ontario today. He spoke to them one last time. Now, interestingly enough, he asked them to dig a trench, and they buried their weapons of war and took an oath to not take them up again. They took a tree and planted it over the top, and he called it the representation of the tree of life. This tree they planted on an island out in the middle of the lake, mostly covered with granite. The white granite was to represent the purity and was a symbol very much like the wampum belt that was used by the Indian women uh, as a representation of their purity during that time. Well, he spoke to them, and here are the principles he said he wanted to make sure they always remember. First was purity of mind and body. The moral stability of the people was most important. Second, he told them to seek to become one with the great creator. The spiritual stability of the people was most crucial to the success of the society. Third, a society must maintain a council and force for self-defense, but it must be tempered by the guidance of spiritual understandings, he said. Thus, when a conflict arises, the councils of the people must include the military and spiritual leaders to make a decision as to how to deal with the problem. And then they would go to the Council of Grandmothers in making that final decision. Fourth, our action is the expression of true thought. By going out and doing good for others, we show this action. By so giving, we receive. And this is certainly a principle we found in every single one of these uh, cultures that did reach a type of utopian society was the fact that they spent time serving others. They really realized the principle that by giving, they receive. Both the giver and the receiver receive. The last two, justice and equality must be maintained in dealing with human rights. And sixth, the strength of the system relies on the strength of the family. All societal relationships depend on it. He concluded by telling them, seek the good of the whole. The time would come when selfishness would become the mode of society. Now, Deganawida prophesied to them, he told them about a great prophecy that to this day, all those different tribes tell the story. And I received this from a Cherokee Indian. Found some fascinating information that the Reader's Digest had done study on Deganawida and his life and, and what had taken place and, and the prophecy that he gave. But he told them that uh, the time would come when a white serpent would come amongst them. And the white serpent would seek to be their friends at first and then would take power over them and almost crush them. Then the time would come later on when this white serpent would be attacked by a red serpent. And this red serpent would have such a hold upon the white serpent, the white serpent would forget everything else and begin to fight with this red serpent. And the red serpent would have almost destroyed the white serpent. 
the Indians, he told them that they were not to become involved in the war, but if they would go the hills, they would be safe. And as they were about to be destroyed, a black serpent would come up out of the sea and would come forward and begin to thrash the red serpent and the white serpent, would kill the red serpent and would almost have killed the white serpent. The white serpent would be laying almost dead and the black serpent would rise up on its chest and begin to celebrate its victory when suddenly a great burst of light would come down out of heaven. And in this light, there would be a power that would overcome and destroy this black serpent and give power back to the white serpent to live. The remaining of the life of that white serpent would raise up and go forward in a repentant state and go and join with the Indian people and would create a society of peace. He told them that at that time, when the white serpent came crawling back to them and to join with them, they were to call upon the Creator and ask that Dagon Aguida would return to join with them. Well, there have been a lot of uh, theories as to who Dagon Aguida is and who he may be. You could see a correlation with the life of this man Enoch, uh, of which this book is written about. The story at the end is the fact that he became translated and was taken up unto God, as the Bible tells and that did not taste of death. And there are those that say, oh, I think it's the prophet Enoch come back. Whoever he is, interestingly enough, in, uh, I think it was 1743, there was a young man by the name of Benjamin Franklin that came upon the story of Dagon Aweda and of the culture that he had uh, formed and studied it and decided this was an incredible system. So great was the system, in his opinion, that he developed a plan called the Albany Plan based on the Iroquois Constitution. And he proposed it to the colonies as a way to bring a similar confederation. Franklin's proposal languished for several decades, and then in one day in Philadelphia, the delegates turned to its provisions and made it the major piece of the final constitution of the United States of America. Now, it's interesting to note that it was not only a uh, piece of the details of the constitution, but also the American Eagle came from the Iroquois nation and the, their constitution. It was their symbol, national symbol of peace. And Franklin and others decided that the eagle should also be the symbol of their peace. The Iroquois, they have the eagle sitting in a tree. Uh, they, they call it the tree of peace. And it's holding six arrows representing the six nations of the Iroquois nation. And of course, the American eagle is holding 13, representing the 13 original member states. Well. I thought that was really interesting to see that uh, our founding fathers had learned a great deal from their red-faced brothers, as well as from prophecy. Many of you may have heard of the fact that George Washington had a great uh, prophetic view of our day, a most powerful story that fits in great uh, detail with what Dagon Awida told the Iroquois nations. He saw the Revolutionary War to its conclusion. He saw that we won. He saw the Civil War. He saw the reason for the war was because of an issue developed around slavery. He saw that later on there was a greater war, that all the nations of the earth came against our country, and that uh, it was almost destroyed, as in many of these other prophecies, but that the uh, American nation was given power from light from heaven, which came upon them, and gave them the strength to persevere and win, and that they then made a union that lasted forever. Well, in a nutshell, that, that is what uh, Washington saw. We found that there were a fair number of them, Benjamin Franklin being one, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, a number of them believed very deeply that what they were doing was building the foundation for that last day Zion that the Bible spoke of. The Bible being one of the main documents they actually used in creating the Constitution, as they studied that, they really believed that the time had come in which they were to help build what some of them called the New Jerusalem. In fact, we found in a couple different books from that time period telling about the people in the New England states uh, were calling themselves the New Jerusalem. They believed that it was time and that they were building the foundation upon which the great last Zion would be built. And so it goes. The Indians, the cultures all over the world, all of us have had a chance to see a day and time when such a thing would take place. Now, when we talk about solutions, probably the most common thread amongst all of these different cultures, as I've mentioned before, is they talk about the fact that if the family's destroyed, the society will be destroyed. Clearly to us, that should be a message of what is so critical to us. 
as I stood there next to death, I knew there was nothing more important in my life than my family and in my relationship with my God. But suddenly nothing else matters. And unfortunately, we are living in a day and time when all too many of us have forgotten what really is important. I believe very firmly that the solutions that these different societies have come up with, one being by giving, you receive. And another being by serving others, we really do create the good for the whole. These are powerful concepts that are really something that brings the power to create this time of peace. I want to conclude by just telling you a real quick story. I had the opportunity to test out this principle of service. A year ago, my family and I, after having come upon some of these solutions from these different utopian societies, I realized what would it be like if you actually just spent you know, some time just going out and serving people only. And so my family and I, we decided, we came up with an idea of going for a two-week vacation. All we did was just go from town to town, place to place, just going and trying to help people. It was a very interesting experience. My teenage son at first going, oh, come on, Dad, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> you really want to do this? And uh, my wife uh, had a few questions about whether I lost my head or not, but uh, we, <laughs> we decided to, to do it anyway. And so we made some little coupons that on it said, uh, sometimes it's just nice to know somebody cares. Have a great day from, and then our kids would put their name on it, or we'd put our name on it. And sometimes we'd just stop. In fact, one day we were driving down the road, and uh, one of my sons, he, he says, hey, Dad, there's a guy out there in that park. He looks to me like he's really sad. Stop the car. So we pull off the start of the car. He jumps out and runs across the park and goes up to this guy and says, here. And the guy goes, what's this, Sonny? <laughs> he, says, he says, just wanted you to know that uh, I think you ought to have a good day. He says, well, thank you. <laughs> Started laughing, patting him on the back. He came back and just hired Nakai. Well, we had some great experiences. There were times when we want to go into big cities, little cities, uh, different sizes to see what kind of reaction would occur. We pulled into this city of Eureka, and we planned to go to the beach and just uh, go out and pick up garbage on the beach. And we're out there. And we thought, gosh, we'll just do this for an hour or two, and, and then we'll go swimming and, and go back to the motel. And I swear, we couldn't go more than about five steps without somebody coming and saying, hi, how you doing? Good, good. What are you doing? Oh, we're picking up garbage here on the beach. Oh, how come? <laughs> well, we just thought it'd be nice to clean it up. Oh, where are you from? <laughs> Idaho. Idaho, and you're here in California cleaning up the beach? Yeah, well, and then we'd start telling about the, the story. I said, you're kidding. Really? You're just doing this? <laughs> yeah. Can we help? Pretty soon, I'll bet you we had, oh, we had a huge group of people walking up and down the beach. We had a group of teenagers who were having a party. They came over with their arms full. Here, here's a bunch of garbage. Can we help out? <laughs> it was contagious. It was so fun. And here were our kids. Uh, one day, we were driving along. My youngest son turns to my oldest son. He says, Brock, you know what I like best about you? What? I said, well, I blah, blah, tell him something. He says, oh, thanks, Creed. Jordan, you know what I like best about you? And the oldest brother then passed on. Pretty soon, everyone had passed a loving message to one another. My wife turned to me, and she looked at me with tears in her eyes, and she said, there is the miracle. The miracle wasn't for the people that we served. It was for us, and it changed our lives. So much so that when I came out of the hospital a couple months ago, my wife and I sat down, we talked about that feeling that we had lost, and I was telling her about how I'd do anything to get that peace back again. I said to her, I know what we could do to get some of it back. Well, let's kind of like go back on that vacation again, but let's just do it here. Let's see if we can just start doing something for other people. And so we met with our kids, and we said, hey, you remember that experience? And everybody's going, yeah. And we said, let's start doing it. Let's go out and just doing something for somebody else, and then at the dinner table at night, we'll tell our stories. Two days later, my Oldest son comes in. He's a teenager, a jock at that. He came up to me. He said, Dad, guess what happened at school today? I said, what? And he said, he's walking down the, the hall, and so there's a boy in our school that's uh, kind of mentally retarded, and he says, there's some kids who are teasing him, making fun of him, picking on him. He said, I went up to the kids, and I said, hey, guys, leave Joy alone. They said, why? He's a nerd. He's blow this and that. He's, cause he's my friend. And they said, oh, yeah. But then he says, leave him alone. And he said, why? He says, because he's my friend. He says, Dad, I, he says, by the fifth time I finally said that, he says, finally they start laughing. He says, okay, I guess if he's your friend, Brock, we'll leave him alone. I guess he's okay. He says, they start laughing, walking down the hall. He said, Joey put his arm up on Brock's neck, and he looked at him, and he said, Brock, why did you do that? Brock looked at him, and he says, because, Joey, you're my friend. I thought, that's the power of the message of these people. That's the power when we want to change a troubled youth 
It's not give them more and more avenues to get away from the home. It's bring them back. Give them a chance to go out and do something for somebody else, and they'll love it. I watched that with my own kids, and I've watched my life be changed by tasting just a little of it. I just want you to know, I do know that there is a time of a society of peace coming. I am most certain of that, and I cannot wait to be a part of it. Thank you very much.